Would you remain standing as we honor God in his word uh, found in 1 Samuel chapter 13 if you've got your Bible or you can grab one in the seat back pocket in front of you as well you can follow along on the screen behind me 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 1 Saul lived for one year and became king and when he had reigned for two years over Israel fancy way to say in his second year of reign Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah and Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. The people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines, well, they mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in the multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. Father, I'm really thankful that the Bible is written in story form, a narrative. It helps us get into people's lives outside of just a a list of theological conclusions. And when we see things happening in people's lives, it helps relate to our life and teaches us theology, teaches us about you, the study of God. And so, Lord, I pray that as we study this story, a story that has so much truth in it, that we would just delve ourselves into this character Saul, and check ourselves, whether or not we're like him or not. And so, Lord, bless the reading of your word. Father, we also pray for um, those that have been affected by the earthquake. We ask uh, that you would just comfort their hearts, especially with the loss of things. Thank you, Lord, that um, you saved lives. We're grateful for that, as well as for the event that happened in Plantation, Florida, Lord, we're grateful that no one lost their life. Uh, We just pray now, protect our country. Lord, watch over us, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. amen. You can have your seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you guys. If you've got your Bibles, you're going to want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13 as we continue our study. As well, put your finger in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, 1 Samuel chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 6. And if you've got your journal, you want to write on the title, The Life Principle, Use the Power of Life's Pressure, Use the Power of Life's Pressure, to empower you. Use the power of life's pressure to actually empower you. There's a truth. Each one of us, each one of us are constantly feeling the pressures of life. Listen to what the great apostle Paul said. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, he's speaking of our bodies, that the excellence of the power of God may be of us, may be of God and not of us. Now listen to this. We are hard pressed on every side. There's a fact of life. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, fact of life, but not in despair. We're persecuted. All those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, another fact of life, but not destroyed. Always caring about the body, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. In other words, if we're going to be a Christian and we're going to live in this world, we're going to face the pressures of life. Well, when you face the pressures of life, it can make you long for the days when you thought there was no pressure, like the days before work. In fact, one author wrote, if each day is a gift, I'd like to know where I can return Mondays. (laughs) Peter Marshall, he was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate in the 40s. 
And he said this in a prayer to the U.S. Senate, speaking of pressure. When we long for life without difficulties, he prayed, remind us, O God, that oaks grow strong in contrary winds and diamonds are made under pressure. In fact, diamonds would simply be a lump of coal if they didn't handle pressure well. Pressure can be constructive. Pressure, like with, diamond, like with a diamond, it takes a coal with a lot of pressure and it makes this beautiful diamond or maybe a thermal power plant where it harnesses the power of steam's pressure, turns the combine to allow us to have electricity. But pressure? Oh, we learned just the other day in Plantation, Florida, in fact, when Fox News had the blip come up on my, the uh, post come up on my phone, immediately I called my mother who lives in Plantation, Florida, and I was hoping to get an answer on the phone that she was nowhere near that shopping center, which was only about two miles away from her home. And I don't know if you saw that explosion. It was a gas leak valve. It was too much pressure and it exploded because pressure can also be destructive. It can be destructive. And so I wonder if quite possibly if we need a spiritual sphygmo manometer. That wasn't tongues. <laughs> Let me say it again. I've been practicing all week. I wonder if we need a spiritual spigvo manometer. Did you hear how quickly it just came out? And really, I've been practicing this word. I even went online and said, pronounce S-P-Y-G-O-M, whatever it is, right? And out it came, spigvo manometer. And then you can slow it down, spigvo manometer. Now, how many of you know what a spigvo manometer is? If you know what a spigvo manometer is, raise your hand. Huh? Oh, wow, we got a few spigvo manometers in here. Okay. Now, if you don't know what a spigvo manometer is, it's a blood pressure cuff. Surprise. <laughs> Your pastor can say big words after all. And I wonder if maybe we need to check our spiritual pressure. Listen to our life principle. Our life principle is use the power of life's pressure, which all of us are going to face, to actually empower you. That's what you've written down because even as God's people, you just come back from Hume Lake, right? You're gonna face pressure. You're gonna go to work on Mondays. Maybe if Monday is the gift, you wanna find a place of return. You're going to find pressure in your life even as God's people because the nation of Israel finds itself under the plight of pressure. The Philistines? The Philistines are the enemy. The Philistines have established an outpost. They've established a garrison. Now, this is just a few soldiers just making sure that the Israelites know you're under Philistine control. We've got you under control. You're under our authority. Not only that, flip over a page, 1 Samuel 13. Listen, it's, chapter, it's verse 19. Listen as the story goes on. Now, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the enemy, or the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks, and a third of a shekel for the sharpening the axes and for setting the goats. Wow. The Philistines, they put this garrison, we want you to know you're under our control, but... We really want you to know that you are powerless so there can be no blacksmiths in the land. You can't have any swords. You can't have any spears. In fact, we're gonna tax you on the most important thing to an agriculturally based community. We're gonna tax you on sharpening the very things that keep you alive, all of your farming tools. So you're gonna have to get taxed in order for you to work to produce food for you. We're gonna impose these taxes on you. We're gonna put this pressure on you. We're gonna be watching you. Well, this was all the Israelites could bear. The pressure was just way too much for them. And Jewish historians refer to this chapter as the war of Jewish independence. 
That's what this chapter is called, the War of Jewish Independence. And as Americans, oh, we know this chapter very, very well. In fact, we celebrate it just on July 4th. July 4th, oh, we've created a tradition in California. We head over to the McLean's. He plays the Declaration of Independence before the fireworks go off. And then we hear the Declaration of Independence and we see these fireworks go off. And it's a reminder of our war of independence. It's a reminder of our declaration of independence when the American colony said, we have had enough pressure from the British Parliament. The Patriots Oh, the American colonies were called the Patriots. The Patriots rebelled against the Stamp Act. And if you remember your history, the Stamp Act was placed on the Patriots. They were to pay for the British military in the Americas. Well, really what the British Parliament was doing was praying for the, paying for the French and Indian War, and they were going to do it through the American colonists. Well, the Patriots... They believed this was taxation without representation, so they started the first Continental Congress, and they made a decision. Well, the British, looking at this first Continental Congress, they decided, well, I don't know if this is such a great idea. Let's relieve them of the stamp tax, but we're going to tax them on tea, and you can only buy tea from one company, and it's going to cost this much. Now, I know tea for you is not a big deal, okay? Now, tea for me is a big deal. You take away tea, it's a big deal, but just imagine if every time you drank a cup of coffee, the government charged you 10 bucks. So your Starbucks didn't cost you four bucks, it cost you 14. Oh, I just saw someone's head go like this. <laughs> now you understand the Boston Tea Party. And so the Sons of Liberty, they go into Boston, Massachusetts, and they destroy this ship that has docked in the harbor and said, no tea from England will we drink. And the Second Continental Congress is formed. And on July 4th, 1776, the United States of America declares its independence from Great Britain and George Washington is appointed as the leader to take the charge to win the war. You see, the American patriots knew something. They took the power of the pressure of Great Britain and they allowed it to empower them to bring change for our nation. That's our life principle. Well, George Washington is set up as the leader, Saul. Saul is set up as the leader now for the war of independence of the Jew. And here he is in his second year. He's leading the charge and he's feeling the pressure of his command. Uh, we learned last week or a couple weeks ago that his job was to save the people from the oppression of the enemy. That was his calling. But now he's under pressure. I want you to look at verse six. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse six. See what kind of pressure he's under. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, look at the parentheses, for the people were hard pressed. They were hard pressed. They're under a lot of pressure. I'm gonna give you an interesting Chet fact. It has no value whatsoever, but just so that you can understand. I don't know if you know this about me, but I really love PB&Js. Like I am a, it is my comfort food. Like PB&J, soft bread, crunchy peanut butter, strawberry Smucker's Preserve jelly, okay? Don't get jam, don't get just jelly. Smucker's Preserve, that is the key. Now listen, when I mentioned Kit Kats, they sold out in all of the stores. So I'm not asking for anyone to bring me PB&Js. What I'm simply saying is I love PB&Js. I love PB&Js so much. I don't know if you ever tried this. I love fried PB&Js. Have you ever had a fried PB&J? Life changer. It is a life changer with some chocolate milk, okay? You just put a little butter on both sides. You put it in, it is cholesterol on bread, okay? So when you eat it, plan on eating healthy for the next six months because this thing has the potential to kill you, okay? This, I love, and what I love about PB&J, especially when it's fried, everything's all melty, right? You better have a plate under you because when you bite into that PB&J, some of you are wondering, where is he going with this illustration? Here we go, okay? When you bite into that PB&J, all of the gushy stuff just comes squeezing out. You better have a plate under there. Now you can make a decision at that point. You can have another piece of bread and just kind of do the whole deal, right? Or you can leave what's squeezed out on the plate. Now listen, let me explain something. When your mouth puts pressure onto that sandwich, everything that's inside the sandwich comes out. Hey gang, it's the same with the pressures of life. 
when there's a little bit of pressure on us, you get to see what's inside of you come out. And it's important to recognize what comes out. It's important to recognize what comes out so that you can know what's inside that needs to be dealt with. That's how pressure is constructive in our life. It reveals to us our spiritual condition and it causes us, once we realize, wow, I didn't know that was in me, it allows the pressure of that wind to make us a strong oak. It allows the pressure of the earth to make that coal into a diamond. But that pressure can be destructive if we don't recognize what's inside of us. That pressure can actually affect our lives and damage us. So we need a spiritual sphygmomenometer to kind of check our spiritual pressure. Well, the Holy Spirit's got a sphygmomenometer on Saul. And we're going to get to see in his life where his pressure is at. And he's got some high blood pressure that he needs to deal with. Let's take a look. Number one, I want you to write it down. Saul is prideful, not prayerful. He's prideful, not prayerful. Write it down. The spirit has got the spigmo monometer on him. He's checking his spiritual pressure and he realizes, Saul, you're prideful. How's that? Saul had access in chapter 11 to 300,000 soldiers. Chapter 11, he had 300,000 soldiers. He whittles them down to 3,000 and the Bible says he sent the rest home. I'm only going to train 3,000. That's all I need. I'm a military champ. Don't you see what I did with the Ammonites? God is on my side. And with 3,000 people, he initiates the war of independence and he attacks the Philistine garrison. Let me give you an explanation of what this would be. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday, right? So all of us got to go to Cane's, okay? Cane's, a little pricey on their chicken, okay? So just imagine, okay? Thousand of us in this room. All of us decide we are not paying for the price of chicken at Cane's, okay? Now, if you work at Cane's, love Cane's, okay? Don't send me an email. Here's the deal. We're not paying. This is an illustration, okay? Love the price at Cane's. So here's the deal. We go to Cane's, and we all show up at Cane's, and Cane says, this chicken's going to cost eight bucks. I'm not paying eight bucks, and all of us, all a thousand of us, attack the 15 employees at Cane's. And then we come out and we say, we won. Well, of course you did. There were 15 of them and there were a thousand of us. And Saul makes a big deal of this. And he sends a message out. Let the Hebrews know we defeated the 15 employees, 3,000 of us at Cain's. This was like a big deal for Saul. He thought this was like a mighty victory. And he thought this would raise up an army. He thought this news would make the Israelites happy and excited. But you ever send a message out that doesn't go the way that you think it should go? Like you say a joke and it just goes flat. You guys, it happens all the time with you. I'll say something and some of you are just still sleeping looking at me. I'm like, come on. Well, this was what happened to Saul, okay? Saul sends a message out thinking that the Israelites are gonna respond. And I want you to see how they respond there in verse four. The Bible says... In verse four, and all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines and also that Israel had become a stench to the the Philistines. This news didn't go over the way that Saul wanted it to. Hey, Saul, you think it's a big deal, but all you really did was make the Philistines mad. And they were mad. Bible goes on in verse five and says, they put an innumerable amount of soldiers together, as many soldiers as the sands of the seashore. In other words, they could not be counted. And they gathered at Michmash just on the east side of beth Now you may go, Michmash, beth what is that? No, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us what Saul's problem is. Michmash, I want you to write it down. It means hiding. The enemy was hiding. And beth means the house of vanity. The house of vanity. And the Holy Spirit is revealing to us where the enemy is hiding out, waiting to attack. He attacks us at the moment we show pride. 
Pride is an avenue. Vanity is an avenue for the enemy's invasion. And there is they're hanging out at Michmash, hiding out, waiting for the pride of Saul simply to get in and attack. Listen to what the wise man Solomon said. It's Proverbs 16, verse 18. Listen carefully. Pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction. It's one of those moments where, hey, you come back from Hume and you think nothing's gonna happen to me. Be careful, right? Because the enemy is lurking at the door waiting for you to think you can do Christianity on your own. Now, I know Saul was to save the people. I know he's the king and he felt the pressure. And I know Saul had one victory with the Ammonite king. And I know he's feeling a little bit invincible, so much so that he sends 300,000 soldiers home and he says, I'm only gonna do this with 3,000. And Saul, I know you defeated the 15 guys over at the outpost with 3,000 men. And then you send out a message. Hey, Israel, we got this. Join us and fight. This message, to me, sounds more like the independent two, three, four-year-old when when you go to help them, they go, got it. I need help. I'm good. No, I'm good. I need help. You go to help them ride their bike. Got it. I'm good. You have no idea how to ride a bike. I got it. (laughs) Kids ever do that to you? Huh? You go to help them, and and you know they're absolutely helpless. There's nothing that they can do. Got it. I'm good. And then they fall down their bike. Help! (laughs) Help! You know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what this sounds like to me. Because though he was called to save the people, it did not abrogate him from the responsibility to seek God in prayer. And there's something missing from these first six verses. We don't read it because it didn't happen. Saul was so full of himself, he just attacked the Philistines and never sought God in prayer. He never humbled himself. He just thought, God, you are with me. And prayer, prayer brings peace. Philippians chapter four, verse six, don't be anxious for anything, but pray so the peace of God that passes understanding will fill your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Prayer brings peace. Prayer brings direction. But quite the opposite with Saul. Take a look at what happens with the people as we finish verse six. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and rocks and tombs and cisterns. Some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Listen to what it did to them. Saul's pride without prayer caused the people to hide. They were so afraid, they clammed up. Some of them just dropped in tombs to get away from the the Philistines. Some of them, so afraid, they ran away. They were gonna get as far away from the situation as they possibly could. Some trembled. And I have found anxiety, anxiety impacts our ability and it limits our capacity. Anxiety affects our ability and it limits our capacity. And when we think we can do this thing, we got it. We don't need any help. Well, Saul's the leader. He's got this prideful attitude. I got this thing. I can do it. And everyone is following Saul, but they're filled with fear because Saul is filled with fear because he feels that he's got this thing on his own. He was prideful. He wasn't prayerful. Saul's under pressure. Write it down. Number two, Saul's wavering instead of waiting. Saul is wavering instead of waiting. Look at verse eight. He waited seven days. The time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel didn't come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offerings here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. And as soon as he had finished the offering, uh, offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Stop there if you would. Saul's wavering instead of waiting. 
Now, I need to help you understand. Would you go back a couple of pages to chapter 10, verse 8? I want to fill you in on the story here. Go back with me. Oh, I'd love to hear those pages. Chapter 10, and I'd love to see this too as well. I'm getting used to this, okay? I'm getting used to it. Chapter 10, verse 8. Take a look with me if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8. Samuel is giving direction to Saul two years earlier. He says, Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I'm coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait, there's the direction, until I come to you and show you what you shall do. There's the word of God through Samuel to Saul. You shall wait seven days. This message was given to Saul two years early. Now let me explain. Saul's been anointed privately. Saul, after the battle with the Ammonites, he was coronated. They said, okay, he's our king. Now, January 20th, he must be sworn in, okay? The presidential swearing in must happen. He's got to be sworn in, and it's a very spiritual thing. That's why it's got to happen at Gilgal. That was the spiritual center, not Jerusalem at this point, because the nation has just started. And so he's got to be spiritually dedicated to the Lord in front of all the people. Well, that's a big event. And I need to let you know, this was a long time ago. Okay, no cell phones, no email, no CNN, no Fox News, no alerts, right? No kinds of form of communication and transportation that we have today. So it's going to take two years to let all of Israel know you've got to meet us so that we can spiritually dedicate Saul as the king. Spiritually dedicate him. There's something else you need to know. The Bible is a written book, so it's linear. Now, let me explain what that means. The story is given to us line by line. There's no way for us to read the full picture by simply reading a verse. We've got to read other verses to get the full picture. That's why we compare spiritual things to spiritual. It's why we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because Matthew didn't tell us everything. Mark and Luke and John help us. Mark didn't tell us anything. Matthew, Luke, and John help us. And so we've got all these four gospels to help fill in and make the color because the Bible's a written book. Well, let me explain what's happening. Another example. I don't know if you know this, but this very time that Saul is making this decision, David, King David, is not king yet, he's a shepherd boy keeping care of his dad's sheep out in the Judean hills at this very moment. But we don't find that out until 1 Samuel 17. Even though it's happening in 1 Samuel 13, we don't find it out until David is looking at Goliath and he says, listen, I've been a shepherd of sheep, filling us into the story. I've been a shepherd of sheep and I fought lions and I fought bears and you're nobody before my God. Because that was happening in 1 Samuel 13. Now that's important. That's really important because Saul is about to disqualify himself from ministry. But God is raising up his man who will not waver, but will wait on him. And so the story gets filled in. But the pressure, the pressure got to Saul. And as we begin to see him squeeze, we begin to see what comes out of him. He realizes, oh, I've not sought the Lord and all of the Philistines have amassed against me. I need to seek the Lord. Okay, everyone to Gilgal, day one, day two, day three. Where is Samuel? Where is he? I've got to seek God. I didn't seek him first. Now I need to seek him. Then I got to give Saul some credit. He tried on his own to do what God told him to do. He waited almost the full seven days. But gang, can you imagine the pressure? Seven days of waiting. You got people leaving you. You got Israel against you saying, Saul, I can't believe you did this. What kind of king are you? You've got people that are hiding. You've got people that are yelling at you and you're sitting there waiting for seven days. It's like a high school student waiting to find out did they get accepted from the college or not. It's like a college grad waiting to find out did I get the job or not. It's like the, 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 the seasoned saint, right? Waiting to get test results back from the doctor. It's not easy, wait. No one likes to wait in line. 
No one likes to wait in traffic. Wait is not a very fun thing, and it can cause us to waver. But Samuel? Samuel has proven to be one who waits on God. Samuel's proven to be one, unlike Saul, who was in constant communication. He wasn't prideful. He was prayerful. He wasn't wavering. Samuel was waiting. Let me prove it to you. Go back. We're going to go back a little bit in Samuel's life. Fill in the picture. 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Look with me at verse 15. 1 Samuel 9. Don't get lazy yet. Keep those pages flipping. 1 Samuel 9, 15. Look at verse 15. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow, about this time, I'm going to send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. Samuel didn't collapse under pressure. You remember the story. Hey, Samuel, your sons are miserable. You're getting old. We want a king. We want a king now. Samuel didn't go, okay, uh, you look like a good one. No, he didn't collapse under pressure. You know, remember what he did? Okay, all of you go home. Everyone go home. I'm going to Ramah and I'm going to wait on God. I'm not just going to pick any random king. No, I'm going to, this is an important decision. I'm going to wait on God. I'm not going to waver in my faith. I'm just simply going to go to Ramah and I'm going to wait for God to appoint his king. And when the day came, God says, hey, by the way, the prince is coming tomorrow. Samuel, without waiting, without wavering, walked right up to Saul and anointed him to be the king. Going back to chapter 13, I asked the question of myself in verse six, Samuel, why did you wait? Why did you wait until 5.59, knowing the Jewish day starts at 6 p.m., why did you wait till 5.59 and show up at 5.59 on the seventh day? Why didn't you just show up somewhere in the middle of the seventh day? Because Samuel had learned in his maturity to wait on God to give him direction. So Samuel didn't go until God released him. Let me explain why. I ask you to turn your Bible to Hebrews 6. Keep your finger in 1 Samuel 13. But look with me at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6. You'll understand why in just a moment. Look at verse 11. Hebrews 6, 11. And we desire, so I have a passion, that each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Now look at verse 12 so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. God, why do you like wait so much? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew. Why do you like wait? Well, this verse helps us understand why Samuel waited, why God waits. He waits because he uses the weight to prepare us to receive the promise. And he knows exactly when to give the promise because he knows when he gives it, when you can handle it. He knows to wait, sometimes a lifetime, until you see that promise that he gave you given because he's preparing you in the wait to be able to handle the promise. That's why he waits. Listen to what James, the brother of Jesus said. I'll read it for you. It's James chapter one. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. In other words, count it all joy when you feel life's pressure on you, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, the quickest way for you to change, to receive the promise of God is through patience, waiting on God. But the problem with wait is the waver. Let's look at Saul. Verse 10, Samuel said, Saul comes up, hey man, Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you didn't come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I'll have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. I want you to write it down. It's our final point, number three. Saul was fearful 
instead of faithful. His spiritual sphygmometer is on him and fear is coming out. He's not being faithful. He's choosing to be fearful. And I love the fact that just before he offers the peace offering, there was a burnt offering and a peace offering. But right before he offers this peace offering, Samuel walks in, surprise. Because let me tell you something, gang. (coughs) There's no way for us to have peace with God when we're prideful instead of prayerful. There's no way for us to have peace with God when we're wavering and not waiting. And what the Holy Spirit will do when we're prideful and when we're wavering, he will come in on that moment, right at that very moment, to get us back on track. He'll put on that spiritual sphygmometer so that we can see where we're at. He'll allow the pressures of life to reveal to us what's being squeezed out of us so that we can become more like Christ. And Samuel walks in on the scene like the Holy Spirit and says, what have you done. Two years ago, Saul, you heard me say, wait for me to come. Wait the full seven days. I'm here. See, order and authority are important to God, gang. I need you to hear this. Order and authority are important to God for your sake. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, he's not the author of confusion. He's not a God of confusion. Sometimes I'll go in my kids' rooms and say, the Trinity does not live here. Okay, this is confusion. We need to invite the Trinity back into this house. Okay, listen, you have to understand he's not a God of confusion. He's a God of order and he's a God of authority for our sake because he knows how quickly we are to go astray. So he blesses us with order And he blesses us with authority to keep us on the straight and narrow. We shouldn't rebel against order and authority. It's God's gift to us. Parents are like the prophet, priest, and king. It's checks and balances. If the king went off, the prophet was there. If the priest went off, the king was there. If the prophet went off, the priest and the king were there. And God had set up this order, a three balanced structure of prophet, priest, and king. And each one had a role and each one had a function in order to check the other to keep the nation spiritually moving forward even though they're under pressure. But Saul, Saul usurps that authority. And instead of owning it, do you hear what he does? This is your fault. You made me do it. You didn't come on time. Saul blames the society. It was the people, they were leaving. I had to do something. Saul blames Samuel. You didn't come when you said you would come. Saul blames the situation. Did you see They're only 20 miles away. And if I don't do something, these people are gonna leave and they're gonna attack and I won't look so kingly. I was forced to do it. Do you hear the excuse? Do you hear the blame? I was forced to do it. And I fear oftentimes that we rationalize our own sin in the same way. Listen, it's the pressure of a person I'm like this because of what someone did to me. There's the blame. It's the pressure, the pressure of the people. Well, I do this because everyone else does it. It's the pressure of a problem. I can't do that because look what happened to me when I tried. Do you hear the blame? Do you hear the excuses? That's not faith-filled, that's fear-filled. Blame and excuses keep us from living in maturity and it actually delays the promises of God. But be careful, it could also disqualify you. Would you look at 1 Samuel 13, verse 13? Samuel said to Saul, he answers his own question. You've done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you, for the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you did not keep uh, keep what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal. In other words, he just left Saul there, and the rest of the people went up after Saul. Listen to what happens. 
He's disqualified. Say that word. None of you said, not all of you said it. You know why? It's a horrible word. I hate that word. You feel that word. I remember when I was a, a swimmer a long time ago in a land far, far away. <laughs> I got up on the block, swimmer, take your mark. And before that beep went off, I was in the water. And you know what the judge said to me? You're disqualified. Oh, it's such a miserable word. Now just imagine I'm in the water by myself. No one else has jumped in. You're disqualified. In front of everybody, stands of people, you're disqualified. And I can just still hear it. You can see the emotional scar, right? Imagine Saul in front of all the people. He looks at him and goes, you're disqualified. You're out. And he just leaves him there and he goes away and leaves Saul to himself. You are disqualified. Your disobedience, Saul, and your blame and your excuses, and you won't own what's being squeezed out of you, you are disqualified. But I want you to hear the faithful counsel because it's the secret to our life principle. He says, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. There's the secret. How do I take the power of the pressures of life and, and let them empower me? I have a heart after God. It's the choice of faithfulness. So now I'm not disappointed anymore. God's got a different plan. And even though I want this so bad, I know God has something better. You see, I'm not going to be prideful. I can make this on my own. No, I'm going to be prayerful. I'm going to choose to be like Samuel, not Saul. And instead of living in fear, no, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to choose no matter what pressure comes my way. God, I'm going to trust you at your word. I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to waver. This is a heart after God. It's the way that we're empowered. Now, many of us believe we have a heart after God. And many of us do. Pressure just helps us see what's inside of us come out. It's a spiritual sphygmometer to let us know if we really have a heart after God. So let me ask you a few questions. Spiritual sigmometer comes on me. Do, do I find peace through prayer when I'm in the midst of pressure? Do I waver in the weight and trust the Lord with all my heart, knowing he can handle it? Do I find myself fearful or do I foolishly offer excuses and blame everybody else instead of taking ownership of my own actions? See, when the Bible talks about a heart after God, it's making God's desires my desires, whatever his desires may be for my life. The pressure, oh, he uses the pressure. And so some questions. Is God my desire? Well, you'll know he's your desire because it's what you do when you're under pressure. Do you react like Saul in pride or do you act like Samuel in prayer? It's where you go when you're under pressure. Do you act like Saul? And do you choose to waver and you go to comfort food, like a PB&J. Or do you choose to wait on the bread of life? It's how you behave when you're under pressure. Here's a spiritual sphygmometer. Do you fearfully blame everybody else or do you accept and own responsibility and faithfully are empowered by God? No longer my way, but his way. Gang, pressure is God's tool to make you a strong oak or a beautiful diamond. Here's our life principle. Use the pressures of life to empower you because God is.